Welcome again to a brand new year and a brand new series of TOSP, the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And we're your hosts once again for an entire year. And we have a wonderful selection of uh, articles for you today. We're going to be discussing uh, temporal cloaking. Uh, we're going to be discussing thorium for energy's silver bullet, uh, p- zombie flies, and a bunch of other interesting stuff that's been going on over the Christmas New Year period. On top of that, we're going to be talking to one of our side bloggers, David Winter, from the blog uh, The Atavism, about him, his life in general, and a big congratulations to him for just handing in his thesis. Without further ado, Amy, I guess we might as well just jump into it. Yeah, uh, thanks, Elf. So the first thing that I'm going to be chatting about today, because it made something of a a splash this week, is uh, this temporal cloaking experiment that's been successfully carried out. Now, some of our listeners uh, may remember that in about November last year, there was a really interesting paper that came out written by um, some rather clever lads from uh, the Imperial College of London, or or, or rather from Imperial College London. And it was involving this new class of materials called metamaterials, um, and and they are getting quite famous at the moment. People are working with them for invisibility cloak type, type stuff, so hiding stuff in space. And these guys had come up with a a theory, well, a theoretical way, rather, or possibly hypothetical way, maybe more accurate, to do the same thing but with time, so to hide an event in time. And they explained basically how this would work. And and it caused a lot of sort of people going, hmm, at the time. And and the way you could think about it or, or... or how you would do that is, so if you think about light rays um, traveling through space, and then you you sort of imagine a, a line at some point along this, these lines of light rays perpendicular to them, and um, you kind of think about almost cutting them. And the leading part of the light, you speed up, while the, the part behind the cut, you slow down. And this opens up a sort of a corridor um, through which something could happen, a person could wonder or you could shoot a laser beam or, or anything. This is all a, a thought experiment. And then what you could do is you could close that gap up again so that um, an observer standing in front before these rays, what they would then see, they would never see that gap that had been closed up. So this is exactly what um, the experimentalists now have have done, uh, which is, <laughs> is really quite happy. What they did was they took um, things called split time lenses They took two of them, and um, so you've got your light, and it hits the split time lens, and what they do is they speed, um, or or blue shift, what they call, um, some of the light, which makes it move faster, and then they slow down or redshift some of the light to make it um, slow down, and then fired a a laser beam. And what happens is if you look at, uh, and then, sorry, on the other side of it, they've got another split time lens again, which, which... speeds up the slow bits of the light and slows down the fast bits of the light and you end up with something that did take place but that you couldn't directly observe. And, and how they measured this, because of course you've, you've got to measure it, was that um, the, the authors basically times things so that this laser pulse should interact with the light beam at a certain time and place. And, and when the cloaking device was off, so these split time lenses weren't, weren't working, um, you could definitely see like a clear signal in the output so that you could see that this laser beam had interacted. But once the cloaking device was, uh, was on, the signal uh, dropped to background levels, basically hiding the laser pulse that had happened. Um, which is just amazing. So, so this gap at the moment maxes out at about 50 picoseconds, which a picosecond is a trillionth of a second. Um, they reckon they could get up to about 110 picoseconds, maybe a little bit higher if they start, you know, playing with like 50 kilometers worth of optic cabling and whatnot. But, but that's sort of about where it is. Now, that's a very, very short period of time. To give people an idea, it takes about 330 picoseconds um, for a common 3 gig uh, computer CPU to, uh, to add two integers. So at this point in time, that's, it's not terribly useful, but they are thinking that there may be ways um, in terms of routing um, information traffic and stuff in computer networks in the future where this might be useful. 
It's absolutely incredible that you can do that in time. I mean, in, in space, it's immediately understandable mm. because it's just, it's like Harry Potter, right? It's like an invisibility cloak yeah. for, for different lengths of light. But to have something temporally isolated in space, it's like you're creating an event horizon almost within this pulse of laser light. Mm. That's just so weird. I'm, I'm really <laughs> struggling to wrap my head around it. It's absolutely amazing that we can do it, though. I'm, I'm quite excited about this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what, what we'll do, we'll link in the uh, the blog post that comes with this, which would be um, cyblogs.co.nz forward slash toss. We'll actually link to some of the diagrams as well because they really help in understanding um, how it works. But But basically, at the end of the day, um, yeah, you're, you're forming this, this weird little pocket, which, which if you think of you're standing in front of the light, you don't see that pocket forming um, when it does. And, and so it's an invisible event. Um, the way you could also uh, uh, think of it is that basically if it would be like uh, someone perhaps had instantaneously moved across a room if you were looking at them. You wouldn't see the period of time that they took coming across the room. They'd just be at one end and then at the other. So it's not teleportation because they're still traveling uh, uh, through the space, but it would certainly look like it's to, to an observer. So it's kind of perceptive teleportation. <laughs> Something like oh, that. Oh, even better. This is getting very kind of matrixy. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Speaking of, of, of strange, weird, and wonderful things, though, uh, the other article that I picked up late last year uh, that was a guest post on Cyblog, uh, on Cyblogs, rather, by uh, George Draculis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's a professor from the Department of Nuclear Physics at Australia National University. And he posts uh, about... Thorium. Uh, thorium is a heavy radioactive element, most commonly known because of its similarities to something like uranium, which is the fuel we use in nuclear fission power plants the world over at the moment. Now, I'm sure many listeners will be aware of the inherent problems with uranium-sourced power plants, which is essentially the they waste. can be... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they, they can be unstable. That said, nuclear energy is still one of the safest and least polluting forms of energy. But the waste is a big problem. It's highly radioactive. It lasts. It has a half-life of uh, millions of years. I'm not sure of the exact figure. I should have looked that up. But it's... And there's nothing you can do with it. You can't burn it. You're, all we do is we get these big lead line barrels and we stick it into the middle of the earth, which, as many people realize immediately, is not a particularly great long-term solution when it's going to stick around and be radioactive for millions and millions of years. And so this element called thorium has received a lot of press and interest recently because it can also be uh, a fissionable material. You can use it either to produce quantities of uranium that you can then put into a nuclear reactor, and it's a slightly different type of uranium than the standard uranium they use in nuclear reactors. So standard uranium that you use in nuclear reactors today is uranium-235. And that's a very, it's a relatively rare isotope. Most mm. uranium that's around is uranium-238. And something like 0.07% of it is the actual useful uranium-235. And that's the stuff that when you put it through the process of a nuclear power plant, uh, gives all this horrible toxic waste and lots of lovely energy at the same time. I can't really undersell that enough. However, if you do this with uranium-233, you don't get the highly radioactive output. Um, you can also fuse thorium directly. There are some reactors uh, under development which allow you to do that. And again, that doesn't produce these really highly radioactive products. That said, it produces radioactive outputs, but they're highly radioactive for a very short period of time, on the order of years, which means that after several years, they would become almost completely inert, almost completely unradioactive. But for that period of time in between them, you have to have somewhere extremely good <laughs> and... Um, kind of immune, you know, good at sealing in radiation to make it safe. So there's been lots of research going on onto these, and they've just come up with a model of a new kind of reactor, which makes all of this inherently stable and safe. So most nuclear fission reactors at the moment, you stick your uranium-235 in the middle, you split, in, split it in half by firing neutrons at it, and then it explodes. And a small amount, amount of the mass that's left is actually turned into energy. And that's where the energy from a nuclear fission reaction comes from. That energy is collected in water, in a huge water bath that the reactor is maintained in. That water is heated up by the energy of the reaction, and that 
that uh, heat turns the water into steam and this steam spins big turbines, exactly the same as in a hydroelectric power plant. It's just the energy source is slightly different. With these new reactors though, they're not using water at all and it's the water that starts to have these big problems because if you get any leaching of the radioactivity from your reactor into the water, the water is, uh, the steam, sorry, is ultimately released into the atmosphere. And usually in, in functional, safe uh, fission plants, that's fine, because it's just steam. It's not radioactive. It's just like normal steam. But if there's any kind of leach, that radioactivity sticks around in the, in the steam, and you can get big clouds of it that are floating all over the place and posing rather large health hazards. So they've designed this new plant to not use steam at all. It's called a molten salt reactor. And essentially what you do is you have this inner reaction of the fission of uranium or thorium. You have it heating up uh, a salt. And what that happens is that if any of the salt escapes from the confine of the, of the reactor, it immediately cools down and solidifies into salt, <laughs> making it far, far safer. If there's, if there's any kind of breakdown, the first thing that happens is everything solidifies, which means you can literally scoop up anything that's got out with a bulldozer and plonk it somewhere safe. There's a wee bit more to the design than that, <laughs> um, obviously, but the other big benefit here is that a lot of modern nuclear fusion, sorry, fission plants uh, use plutonium as the original source. So they get plutonium and pl plutonium decays or can be induced to decay to produce this uranium-235. Now plutonium is the material of choice for nuclear weapons. Not only can you make nuclear fission weapons out of it, but you can also make dirty bombs. Dirty bombs are bombs that contain large amounts of radioactivity. So rather than the initial explosion being the dangerous but you have huge amounts of radioactivity scattered all around the landscape it's it's disgusting and horrible and it can make things make locations uninhabitable mm. for long periods of time so the fact that you don't have to do anything with plutonium you don't have any involvement with it at all means that this is an inherently much safer way of using these nuclear fuels um the guy in question who makes the blog post, sorry, getting back to my point, uh, George Rakoulis, um, goes through the specific uh, benefits and drawbacks of each of the different reactor types and eventually comes up and saying, look, thoriums are a really, really good fuel. It's being oversold because uh, there's a lot of money in business and lobbying behind it, but it is something that we should look at as a potential future fuel source which we'll desperately need to fuel our planet in the future very very interesting article yeah, interesting yeah I've, I've, I've got at least one mate who I think is uh, a couple of years ago already started like buying stocks in thorium and stuff like that so so we'll see as you said there's a lot of money in it but anything that's going to be cleaner can only be well one hopes can be better and and at the moment unfortunately renewable technologies just aren't able to produce the kind of capacity that that uh, the large-scale capacity that we need I think they will in the long run, but I think there's so no as well. question in my mind that we'll need a kind of stopgap to get us there. Absolutely. Um, and hopefully something like thorium, something nice and responsible, but with a decent energy output, might provide something like that. Yeah. That said, all of these reactors are in the research and development stage, and none of them are on uh, commercially available yeah. yet. Although they are working, so, yeah. you know, there's that. <laughs> Uh, certainly, certainly an interesting time energetically. Um, right. Well, uh, speaking of, of nothing at all about energy, um, but but something about zombies because well, we like the zombies. Um, right. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, there's been yet another zombification of insects um, seen. So I guess the zombified ants are probably uh, the zombie creatures that people are most familiar with, um, and these are parasites basically, or, or fly larvae sometimes that. Um, take over the uh, uh, brains of, of, of insects, cause them to do behaviors which they wouldn't normally all in um, sort of, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here, all with the idea of helping the said parasite to continue its life cycle. Uh, there's phenomenal photos and, and tons of stuff out there about it. Go and have a look. Uh, but this, this one is really interesting. Now, as, as I'm sure many people would have heard, there is a major uh, worldwide issue with honeybee populations. Honeybees, of course, being the bees which fertilize uh, or rather pollinate um, a number of crops and trees for humanity, uh, as well as you know, a bunch of other flowers and, and plants out there. And they're 
Uh, populations have been tanking very, very, very badly all over the world, particularly in the U.S. and I think Britain, over the last couple of years. And it's been something of a mystery. Now, mm-hmm. recently, um, and, and again, I think in the last couple of years or so, the, the term CCD or colony collapse disorder has been coined to describe this issue of honeybee colonies just failing to failing to thrive, shall we say. Um, and with all the attendant worries about that, um, you know, if we don't have honeybees, then we can't fertilize our crops. It's it's a bit of an issue, uh, and neither can the rest of nature. Um, but it, and there are a couple of things already. There's apparently there's a virus that that deforms wings. There's also a, another thing called um, nosema, which basically means that colonies do less well overall. Uh, they gather less food. Their queens don't do as well. It's 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 this horrible horrible sort of disorder. But there's a new thing. And it's about zombies. Um, now, this is this is completely new, but there is a a species of fly called Apocephalus borealis, which has been discovered to be inserting its eggs into the bees and then using their bodies as homes for uh, developing larva. Now, what is so interesting is that honeybees are probably one of the more closely studied insects um, on Earth, and this has never been seen before. This fly uh, does do the same thing to bumblebees and paper wasps, but uh, first time this has been seen. So it's been discovered in uh, colonies in Northern California. Um, uh, Apis mellifera, if anyone's interested, is the species name for for the honeybees in question. And what happened was, (laughs) and this is just a wonderful example of, of, of serendipity, I guess, in science, is John Haffinick, who's a biology professor at San Francisco State University, um, had collected some dead bees from the ground underneath lights around the university's biology building and chucked them in a vial on his desk and then forgot about him and noticed uh, sometime later when he looked at the vial that there were all these little fly pupae, so fly bleh, larvae type things, surrounding uh, the bees. Uh, which is really, really interesting. Uh, the, the, the flies are, are a fraction, like a minute fraction of the size of the, um, the bees, so, it's, so they wouldn't be you know, obvious necessarily. And so they found that this is this um, fly that's also been parasitizing bumblebees and, and paper wasps. And uh, they found evidence of the fly in 77% of the hives they sampled in the Bay Area of California, um, as well as in some other areas as well, and are now thinking that this might be... Um, certainly contributing to CCD. Uh, what, what, the, what happens apparently is that the fly lays eggs in a bee's abdomen and, and then several days later the, um, this parasite, parasitized bee sort of bumbles out, at the hi- uh, bumbles out of the hives, often at night, uh, sort of heading off randomly into the middle of nowhere. Uh, sometimes they fly towards lights and they can't really control their own bodies very well uh, and then they die. And as many as 13 fly larvae crawl out from, from the bee's neck. There are pictures. Uh, they're, they're pretty pretty horrifying. Um, and uh, so what they're doing at the moment, Hafenick and, and some of his grad students and things are, are just sort of trying to find out where this infection is, is taking place. It doesn't look like it's happening in the hives, they don't think. So they're thinking possibly it's happening while the bees are out foraging. But that's, that's the next step because it may help uh, farmers, for example, um, ice, well, both figure out... Um, sort of where in, in, in the hive they need to be isolating bees if it looks like they're infected, but also uh, if they can figure out where the bees are picking up this infection, they can possibly isolate or do something about those areas. Uh, very, very, very interesting stuff. Absolutely. It'll be really nice if we can prevent the spread of, of, of CCD. Yeah. I mean, uh, it looks to me, as, I mean, this story is still evolving because as, yeah. as uh, Amy said, there's all these different particular effects. And by the way, if you're interested in the in that particular virus that has been associated with colony collapse, uh, there's a really good episode of uh, TWIV, This Week in Virology, <laughs> that discusses that um, and the particular virus in depth. But they all have such strong associations with colony collapse. It's really hard to know if it's just one of these or if it's two or three or a, a kind of combination. I imagine it'll be a combination effect and probably with, with certain things uh, more primary in some areas or due to some you know, characteristics of the bees than other. But, but, but something as catastrophic as colony collapse disorder, it doesn't make sense that it would just be one thing anyway. Um, it's still poor old honeybees. Yeah, I know, really not cool here, but but it's cool. I mean, the 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 closer we get to understanding all of exactly what's going on, the more likely we are to be able to do something about it. As is what what's already starting to happen in the states, for example, is that they're trucking commercial bees around in trucks and um, and like mobile bee uh, pollination 
camps, <laughs> for want of a better word, which is also, there, there's also been some interesting research there uh, and, and ongoing research about the, the kind of stresses that that might be putting on the bees. It may not be helping them. It's, it's one person compared it to, you know, if you were fed only on Hershey bars, kept awake all night, you know, moved around consistently and things, you'd probably feel a bit sick as well, wouldn't you? Um, so, so a lot of a lot of research going into not only external influences, but possibly what we might be doing as well. Uh, even even you know possibly other pesticides that that target the parasites that bees succumb to. You know, is is that affecting the bees? What what is going on? I guess it's one of these things. that's watch this space. Yeah, very much so. 